how did you how did you evolve your craft? Like he had to be one of your inspirations, yeah. and he's funny as hell. Mm -hmm. um, but what was it about Richard that inspired you? And then how did you continue to grow your craft? He was this guy that I didn't care what culture you were from. Richard Pryor's picture painting ability was just next level, man. He made you see Miss Rudolph. He made you see Mudbone. He made you see the old wino directing traffic in the street. He watched you. He made you understand about the hood if you never even been to the hood. This dude, man, was painting pictures so vividly, talking about his life. He talked about what really happened to him. And I was sitting there going, wow, that's what I want to do. I, I want to do that. And so... I had no idea how I was going to get on TV. You know, married at 24. I got twins at 25. I'm out of work. I'm broke. I got nothing. I'm sitting on my steps. Uh, some guys came up, man, that knew I needed some money, asked me to drive this car for them. And uh, I said, all right, man, I'm, let me get my jacket, because I needed the money. I come back out on the porch. A friend of mine who knew me, he said, hey, man, where you going? I said, I'm finna do this deal with you, so I'm going to drive this car. He said, no, nah, no, nah, you ain't. He said, Steve, I don't know what it is about you, but you're gonna, you the one of us that's going to get out of here. He said, you're going to be something special. You ain't driving the car. Now, everybody knew how I drive. I can, I can drive a car, man. I've been driving since I was 13. And he said, no, nah, man, this ain't what you do. He said, I tell you what, we're going to go do this deal. If you do the deal, I'm going to give you some money to help your family out. Because I was struggling. This dude talked me into not getting in that car. I didn't get in that car. Four people was in that car. Two people still doing life sentences right now. I was just going to drive. But I needed the money. So God talked me out of that. It was not a month later. This is how God worked, man. It was not a month later. I was writing jokes for this guy named A.J. Jamal. And he would pay me $10 a joke. I didn't even know what he was doing with him. Everybody knew I was funny and I could drive, right? So he'd come to me every week. I'd write him a joke. He'd give me $10. So one day I'm over his house about to turn in these jokes. And this girl is over there. And she said, you the guy that's writing these jokes for him? I said, yeah. She said, he the funniest dude at the comedy club. I said, at the what? She said, comedy club. I'm 27 years old. I've never even heard of a comedy club. And so she said, why are you writing them from here? Why don't you tell them yourself? I said, they got a place you can go tell jokes? <laughs> <laughs> she said, yeah. So like, you know, man, I went back and I got two Richard Pryor albums out. I started playing them all week, man. Uh, and I loved his albums. I said, man, I'm going to go find this place. She said, Tuesday night, they have amateur night. I'm going to come pick you up. I want you to come down and watch and sign up for the next week. So I get to the comedy club, 40 minutes from Cleveland. I sign up for the next week. We're sitting there watching the show. Everybody cracking up laughing. I'm not laughing at nothing. I'm staring because I'm mesmerized. Because every joke them guys told, I either knew the punchline or I knew the punchline they should have said. And I was sitting there. So nine guys went up. They got to guy number 10. They called his name. He wasn't there. They called his name again. He wasn't there. The guy got sick and just left. He said, well, hey, we're going to go to next week's list. Where's Steve Harvey? Oh. Now I'm sitting there, man, and I heard him say that, and I turned to the girl. I said, it's a dude in here got the same name I got. <laughs> she said, you about a stupid son of a bitch. That's you. And he said, Steve Harvey, come on up. Man, I had nothing. So I just ran on stage because they was clapping. They was clapping, <laughs> man, for me. I walked on stage, and the first word out of my mouth was, hey, man, y'all can stop all this clapping because I ain't even supposed to be here the next week. <sighs> They're laughing. And so then I remembered, I got these jokes I'm about to sell Jamal. Let me go and do these jokes I was about to say. So I started doing these jokes. They cracking up. Next thing you know, I started doing this story about when I was a boxer. 
how a dude hit me so hard one time. I did this joke. And so the guy comes up and he goes, which means cut. But I ain't in show business because I thought he meant you killing them. You cutting their throat. So I keep going. So then he does like this, wrap it up, wrap it up. I'm thinking, keep going, keep going. So finally, they just cut the mic off on me. I walk off stage, they bring us back up to do a clap off. Ten guys. I win the clap off. I win amateur night, $50, October 8th, 1985. I had a part-time job selling insurance. I went to work the next day, October 9th, quit my job. Why? I'm finna go be a comedian, man. What? Yeah. I found, I've, I've been talking to God a long time. <laughs> and he told me what I was going to be that night. I'm finna go be famous. I'm going to get on TV. I'm going to be a big star. I got $50. I lost my family. I became homeless. I lived in a car for three years. That's how I started. Today, if you go home and cut your TV on seven days a week, the little boy with the stuttering problem, the divorced dude that lost his family, the homeless dude that lived in the car for three years, he's on TV all day. You can't cut your TV on. He on there all day. Because that gift I had that I saw in Richard Pryor, I expounded on it. I believed in it. I trusted in the faith that God do what he say he going to do, that your gift will make room for you. See, when he say gift make room for you, it mean it allow you to spread out. It'll, it'll let you do things you never thought you could do. See, I just talk regular, y'all. I, no, I ain't got no education. You know, I ain't got no uh, uh, degrees or nothing like that. You understand? I have a real understanding, though, of what it take to make it. And when it get funky out there and it look like you ain't going to make it, See, the reason I'm, I'm good at this type of thing, I could tell people how to get up because I've been down. I could tell you how to get over because I've been under. I can tell you how to win because I done lost. I could tell you how it feel to, 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 to be the best because I've been the worst. I could tell you what it is to get the award because I ain't never won nothing before. And so all of this that's processed myself, that God sent me through, equipped me and got me to the day. And once I took that comedy gift, that gift is your tree trunk, but you can have branches. So even though my core gift is comedy, I can write a book, I can get in a movie, I can do a TV show, I can be a speaker. It's just when I'm speaking, when it look like it's getting dull, <laughs> I hit this button and I make them laugh. Because ain't nothing worse than a dry ass speech. <laughs> ain't nothing worse. You ever had with graphs and stuff? You ever had a speaker oh, yeah. talk with them charts? Once you cut the lights out and you have a chart, my ass is going to sleep. <laughs> That's why I couldn't do college, because they had graphs. Once you show a graph, that little line that do like that, <laughs> I'm going to sleep, because you dry. And if I'm talking and it look like I'm not doing well, I hit the button and tell a joke. And so even as a motivational speaker, that's become one of the branches, man. And I take that gift that God gave me and I, and I just expound on it, man. I don't ever get too far away from the gift. I don't ever forget at the core of it, I tell jokes. 